Hello and welcome to the dialogue. I'm Shivam Thakur. And today we have a very special guest, none other than Mr. Shashi Tharoor, diplomat, politician, thinker, author, and much more than that. Thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to do this interview. Pleasure, Shubham. Sir, you always stood for Section 377. So why do you think you are facing so much of opposition for this? Well, I stood against Section 377 because the decriminalization is what I was working for. To my mind, the government has no place in the bedroom. And this kind of old-fashioned law written for us by the British to reflect their morality rather than our culture has created a situation in which innocent Indians are being harassed for what they do in the privacy of their own homes and their own love lives. I think we've got to a point where we really have to wake up and ask ourselves the freedom that Mahatma Gandhi fought for has to be a freedom for people to be themselves as long as they don't harm others. And I think it's extremely important that when it comes to things like consensual actions between consenting adults in the privacy of their own homes, the state has no business to be there. This is why I, I, I really felt we should decriminalize it. Unfortunately, there are some still very uh, tradition-minded or conservative-minded, I should say, reactionary people in the ruling party who prevented my attempts to, to decriminalize this. And I, I'm surprised the justifications they give don't make sense. They talk about the sanctity of the Indian family. People are not choosing to be homosexual because it's legal or illegal. They, God has made them that way. So the fact is that by talking about the Indian family, you want to force homosexuals to make some poor woman unhappy by pretending to uh, be a heterosexual person, when in fact their real wishes are elsewhere. And these things create other problems in our society. So the objections are wrong and ill-founded. And I do believe that at the end of the day, though my attempts in Parliament didn't work, I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court, which has accepted the idea of a review petition, will look at this very carefully. So, uh, so I'm personally against uh, Section 377. When I said stood for, I meant uh, against Section Stood for its decriminalization, yeah. yeah. So there is so much of discussion and debate around the implementation of uniform civil court in India. So we know India is a diverse country. Do you think its implementation will compromise with the diversity of India or it is only about the personal draconian law which has to be removed by its implementation? You know, it's a very tough one to answer. Intellectually, I sympathize with the idea of a uniform civil code on the grounds that um, we are one society, one common citizenship, we all have the same rights and should have the same in this area. On the other hand, you know, we're not living in a theoretical world. We're living in the world in which we actually are, where people of certain communities have enjoyed their own rights to have their own personal law for centuries. Are we now going to tell them that we're going to take away rights? I, I think that's the real problem. I mean, I, I, um, I think that if you were to actually accept the fact that a uniform civil code is desirable, then you must persuade others that it's desirable for them too. And that persuasion has not properly been attempted. It's instead been seen as advocacy of something at the expense of the other uh, interests of particularly minority communities. And that's why there has been some resistance to it. I think in a democracy, we have no choice but to respect their resistance, even where we may think it's wrong. As a Democrat, I would also say that every individual of any community should have the right to opt out. So let's say if you're a Muslim woman and you want to marry, not according to the Sharia law, which is permitted under personal law, but you want to marry under the Indian civil laws and register your marriage, you should have the legal right to do so and the state should protect your right to do so. So, so coercion should not be there. If that's the case, then certainly for the rest, personal law can continue. So are you saying there should be a proper dialogue discussion to solve this uh, dilemma and then bring about uniform civil court in this country? But the discussion must be more within each community. I think, frankly, for a, a Hindu law minister of India to go and preach to Muslims that you need to join the uniform civil court will not go over well. But if intellectuals, writers, journalists, thinkers um, were to encourage a discussion within the Muslim community, were to um, themselves uh, engage with Muslim intellectuals and thinkers, create a certain amount of, of, of pro and con for reform. It's interesting that recently on the triple talaq issue, there was a great deal of uh, discussion and ferment within the Muslim 
community, particularly Muslim women, uh, saying that they didn't like triple talaq, and many Maulanas and so on coming out and saying that, in fact, this was a distortion of what was correct Islamic practice. So you can imagine a discussion of this issue. Why can't you imagine a discussion of other issues relating to marriage, divorce, and inheritance, which is what personal law is all about, just a handful of things. So there is so much of unrest and trouble in the, in the valley, in Jammu and Kashmir. So what are your views on those unrest, trouble, tumult, and also what are your views on Article 370? Are you for its repeal, revocation, or what are your views? See, once again, it's a question of you can't wish to start somewhere else than where you are. You know, we are not sitting in 1947, we're sitting in 2017, 70 years later, and for 70 years, or almost 70 years now, the people of Kashmir have accepted uh, that their, the basis for their link to the rest of the country is Article 370. There is no doubt that any attempt now to revoke Article 370 will not only be resisted by the usual suspects, as we say, the people who are anti-Delhi and anti-India, but even the mainstream Kashmiri political parties, which have been functioning within the ambit of the Indian constitution, contesting elections and so on, like the National Conference, like Mehbooba Mufti's PDP, they themselves will be extremely negative if India were to uh, abolish 370. So you must understand the concept of acquired rights. You know, you may not, for example, necessarily wish to wear a suit. But if you have had the right to wear that suit every day, everywhere you want to wear it, and then somebody comes in and says, now I'm taking away that suit and you'll only wear a shirt and tie, you may resent it, saying, you know, I have enjoyed this right. Why should I not continue to if I want to? And that is precisely the problem with all these examples you've taken. So Gorkha Jan Mukti Morcha is uh, demanding for separate statehood in uh, West Bengal. What are your views on that? Should we go for a separate statehood? I mean, it's not off the top of my head in the sense that right now you can't just give in to an agitation. There has to be in any case uh, respect for the constitutional order. But as a larger proposition, I would argue that in a country our size, we could very easily imagine the creation of a state's reorganization commission to look into such questions as what is the viable size of a state, what are the principles on the basis of which a state should be formed or organized? What is the desirable population within a state? And so on. Right now, we have an absurd situation where we have you know, a state the size of Uttar Pradesh with over 200 million people and a state the size of Sikkim, tiny place with less than a million people. This kind of uh, 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 range uh, means that our states are really quite astonishingly diverse. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Even a country like America, you have Texas on the one hand and Delaware on the other. So big and small is not the issue. But at a time when we're talking about becoming the largest single democracy in the world, with uh, we've already crossed 1.3 billion, we're going to cross 1.4, we're going to overtake China. In the next few years, uh, at least within the next decade, we'll be the most populous country in the world. We have to ask if these state units are manageable, whether you can actually administer something as large as UP through the mechanisms of the state. Either you decentralize massively to every district, or I think you consider in a state's reorganization commission principles to break up the states. And if you did that, if you actually divided UP into three or four states, as many have suggested, a Harit Pradesh here, a, 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 a Pura Pradesh there, a Bundel Khan there, etc., then you may actually find um, four states of 50 million each rather than one state of 200 million. And uh, you may or may not agree that that principle also extends to a s relatively small state like uh, a, a, a Gurkha land area within Bengal. You may not agree or you may agree. That depends on the state's reorganization commission. Staff it with serious people, judges, former politicians, former governors, people with a real background in all of these issues and have them come up with some principles. I must say that um, even the Telangana separation would not have been so messy if it had come at the end of a very reasonable process that the entire country was following. Sir, if I'm not wrong, uh, Finance Minister of India, <coughs> Mr. Arun Jaitley said that there won't be any law against lynching separately. But you are asking for law against lynching. Why so? Well, I disagree respectfully with my old friend Mr. Jaitley on this because 
the argument that he's making is that there's, murder is already illegal, so how do you need uh, a separate law for a different kind of murder? Murder is murder. But the answer that I have is that this is not just murder. There are larger issues involved, including the fact that a collective group of people, a mob, kills somebody, and often shelters behind the anonymity. It becomes very difficult to prove that this particular individual committed a murder, and there are 40 people, 50 people in a mob that are beating this person. So this kind of thing requires a different approach to the law. There's also issues of police responsibility, uh, local administration's responsibility. Hold them culpable, hold them responsible. There's a question of the minimum sentence. There's a question of certain procedures to be followed. Because this is murder plus a hate crime. In most cases, mob lynching is also a hate crime. And therefore, in some ways, the feeling is that it should not be just seen as any other you know, crime of passion or any other kind of murder. So do you think in most of the unfortunate cases of mob lynching, it's organized in some way or the other, or it's just a random mob which, which kills the other person? Well, there are so many cases, sadly. Um, a lot of riots in our country seem spontaneous but are in fact organized or at least instigated. And the same is true of much mob violence. Um, of course, very often things get out of hand. Uh, there may be half a dozen people who just want to quote-unquote teach somebody a lesson by beating him up, but more people join, it gets out of control, the person is killed, and then everyone runs away and no one wants to be responsible. So we need to stem this at the very beginning. And the other advantage of passing a law is in actually signifying greater public awareness, signaling to the people that uh, this crime is going to be singled out for special punishment. So now China has started constructing road in parts of Doklam, which is claimed by Bhutan. Now India is also supporting Bhutan, but the China is saying it's a disputed territory. Now again, China is intruding and trying to threaten us in a way. What are your opinion on that? No, there is no doubt that our entire frontier with China is unsettled, is in fact disputed. Uh, part of the problem is that um, uh, the maps were drawn in a different era. They did not have sophisticated techniques. There are some elementary mistakes. For example, the assumptions that the Chinese are following when it comes to the uh, Doklam area are based on an agreement of 1890, which can legally lend itself to two different interpretations. A place is mentioned that the Chinese claim, but the watershed is mentioned, which actually favors the Indian approach. So all of these things mean that you really do need to sit down in a constructive modern spirit with all the modern technology, satellite maps, photographs, detailed inch by inch reconnaissance and come up with a sensible conclusion. The problem at the moment is the Chinese don't seem to be interested in doing that. They're not interested in talking. They're saying this is our position, our way or the highway. You have to listen to us. And India is not prepared to accept that. India is also a big country. We may not be as large an economy as China uh, or as large a military as China, but we feel we are strong enough to just say no. And I think at this point, the only sensible thing for both countries to do is to talk. India is willing to talk. So far from what I've gathered, the Chinese have not shown themselves willing to talk. So, as far as uh, I understand, China is opposed to the India's membership to the UNC, United Nations Security Council, permanent member. Now again, China opposes to us in energy, nuclear supplies group. So what do you think China is doing? Is it China afraid of us? If China is not afraid of us, why is it not living <laughs> in healthy competition with us? Well, on the Security Council, China has never officially opposed us. They have opposed Japan which was a claimant along with us, but they have never officially publicly said we are against India coming into the Security Council. What their real views are is a different matter. They may really not want us to come. But sir, don't you think they oppose us to be the member? I think de facto they don't want us to come they because they don't want India to enjoy the same status that they have. Similarly, when it comes to, um, when it comes to the nu nuclear suppliers group, they have tried to put us down by saying India can come in only if Pakistan also comes in which is very different because Pakistan has a shameful record in proliferation of technology, smuggling of technology and so on, whereas India has developed its own technology and is very, very correct in not violating any of the international codes and conventions. Um, and there are other issues on which we disagree with the Chinese. I think the Chinese have certainly seen uh, a need to keep India off balance to show that they, the Chinese in other words, um, are peerless 
uh, as the, supre the, the preeminent power in this part of the world. And you know, the funny thing is that actually there are a number of areas in which we have the same interests. To take just one example, keeping open the sea lanes of communication from East Africa and the Gulf to China means also keeping them open to India because India is on the way to China. <coughs> so we should actually be cooperating. We should be having joint anti-piracy patrols. We should be taking on a common responsibility for looking after those waters. Instead, we are looking at each other's navies with hostility and suspicion, and it starts really with the Chinese attitude. So in my own view, uh, uh, a real corrective is required from the Chinese side. So permanent court of arbitration has uh, given a judgment that the South China Sea does not belong to China. Now again, China is not accepting the verdict. Why is it so? What's your the Chinese again, you know, when it suits them, they argue on the basis of history. They have something called the nine dash line, nine dashes on a map, which gives them most of the South China Sea, all the little islands in it, and then the economic zone around those islands. The real motive for the Chinese is both uh, geostrategic and also economic, because obviously they want to have access to the resources in those waters, whether it's fish, whether it's minerals, whether it's oil. Uh, and the fact is that uh, in asserting their claims, they're basically relying on sheer muscle power. They are tougher, bigger, stronger than any of the neighbors. And they're saying, we will have our way, which is not the logic of international law. International law says whether you're powerful, whether you're weak, it's one law for all countries. And I think the Chinese uh, have to learn a little bit how to coexist with others. There may be some, like the Philippines currently has a president who has more or less surrendered before Chinese might. But the other countries, countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, and so on, have certainly not surrendered. And they're saying, no, we stick to our claims, and Japan as well, particularly. So ever since Rahul Gandhi took charge of Congress party, you are facing defeat after defeat in all the elections. Don't you think there should be a leadership change in Congress party? Why don't you take charge of Congress party? <laughs> First of all, the party doesn't work that way. Secondly, I think there is a settled procedure for establishing the leadership in our party or in any party. And in our case, there is no vacancy. Sonia Gandhiji is the president, Rahul Gandhi is the vice president. If a change is to come, it will certainly be that of the vice president becoming the president, that's the way the system works. But I think that, you know, one doesn't have to look at individual leadership to make a difference. I believe I can make a big contribution through my own skills, my own abilities to the work of the party. Today, the day you and I are speaking, we've just announced the setting up of an All India Professionals Congress, which I will be the national chair of, in which we will try and encourage professionals to come in and actually work, uh, find a platform for themselves within the party and also work uh, in politics through a, a mechanism that was not available to them before. So with that, we come to the last question of the interview. Sir, if it ever happens that you are declared the prime ministerial candidate of India, would you like to be the prime ministerial candidate for the 2019th election? I, I, if I answer that question, you'll simply get me into trouble with friends in my own but party. Please be frank. <laughs> no, look, I'm obviously somebody who would be honored and happy to take on any challenge okay. that the country offers me. I was proud to be the country's standard bearer at the United Nations Secret Secretary General race. I lost. If tomorrow uh, they ask me to do another race in which um, I may or may not win, I'm happy to do that. Uh, we've just seen two very fine people contesting for president and, and vice president from the opposition, even though they knew that the results would not go in their favor. I do believe that for myself, it is not just a question of a position, a title, it's a question of being able to serve, being able to make a difference. I came back from a very comfortable life abroad in order to make a difference. And that's what I see myself striving to do as long as I can. Thank you so much, sir. For Thank you, Shubham. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the interview on The Dialogue. We'll be back very soon with another personality, interesting one. Thank you so much.